Thank you so much, Meg, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming out today. Um, I, my name is Sharnita Midget, like Meg just said. I am the outreach coordinator for the Penn Memory Center, uh, which is a Penn Medicine resource for those seeking services related to dementia and brain health. Uh, there are education, training, and support services provided by clinicians, our social work team, and communications team, who all work together to provide uh, comprehensive care. For our patients, research participants, and their families, we offer free counseling anytime in person or over the phone. That could include education about their diagnosis, emotional support, suggestions and referrals to local resources like home care aids and social activities. First priority to some of our programs like our memory cafes and caregiver retreat and the caregiver class, which is a seven week psychoeducational class for family caregivers. So I started working at the center in 2018 as a communications intern. And during that time, I heard many stories of uh, older adults. These stories would come from people from all walks of life. So this would include people with normal cognition who are experiencing normal aging, which we'll talk about today and those who have Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and who are experiencing uh, that decline in aging. So one story that I heard from my time here that really stuck with me uh, is that of Karen Wheeler. Uh, so her mother was actually a patient at the Penn Memory Center and she wrote a three-part series kind of explaining her story and process being a caregiver. And I'd like to share a little bit of that story with you all today before we get started. When Karen Wheeler's mother, Vivian Wheeler, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 2003, she began a journey. As her mother progressed through the stages of Alzheimer's disease, Karen had to discover ways to work through emotional, physical, and mental challenges. She wrote a three-part series that explored her journey. She discussed more than just her challenges, her daughter's feelings on caregiving. In part one, Karen talked about the positive moments and triumphs that were the result of time spent closely with her mother. And the adjustment process of getting back into the job market after years of providing around the clock care for her mother. She wrote, knowledge is power. For me, it's important to share all I've learned and continue to learn about Alzheimer's disease with others who are caring for a loved one. So I wanna thank you all again for joining us during this series as we learn not just about Alzheimer's disease, but also what it means to age and the different factors in aging and healthy aging. And you can go to the next slide. So for the first class of this series, uh, I'll be giving an overview of the things you're going to learn about throughout the rest of the series. So uh, these will be topics like uh, uh, different. So for these for today's topic, uh, we will be talking about normal aging. And for uh, the agenda, we're going to talk about why do we age and what is normal aging? What is dementia and Alzheimer's disease? What are social determinants of health? What can we do to keep our brains healthy as we age? And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about the upcoming classes and some of the things you're gonna hear uh, later on. Also, because this is an overview, this class may be a little shorter and go in a little less depth that, than the other classes will. Uh, but uh, rest assured that if you have any additional questions, comments, or thoughts about uh, any of the specific topic areas mentioned today, you'll definitely be able to learn more about them and have your questions answered in upcoming classes. And you can go to the next slide. So first, I'd like to start with uh, this video that talks about what aging is. In 1997, a French woman named Jean Calmont passed away after 122 years and 164 days on this earth, making her the oldest known person in history. Her age was so astounding 
that a millionaire pledged $1 million to anyone who could break her record. But in reality, living to this age or beyond is a feat that very few, maybe even no humans, are likely to accomplish. Human bodies just aren't built for extreme aging. Our capacity is set at about 90 years. But what does aging really mean? And how does it counteract the body's efforts to stay alive? We know intuitively what it means to age. For some, it means growing up, while for others, it's growing old. Yet finding a strict scientific definition of aging is a challenge. What we can say is that aging occurs when intrinsic processes and interactions with the environment, like sunlight, and toxins in the air, water, and our diets cause changes in the structure and function of the body's molecules and cells. Those changes in turn drive their decline and subsequently the failure of the whole organism. The exact mechanisms of aging are poorly understood, but recently scientists have identified nine physiological traits, ranging from genetic changes to alterations in a cell's regenerative ability that play a central role. Firstly, as the years pass, our bodies accumulate genetic damage in the form of DNA lesions. These occur naturally when the body's DNA replicates, but also in non-dividing cells. Organelles called mitochondria are especially prone to this damage. Mitochondria produce adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, the main energy source for all cellular processes. Plus, mitochondria regulate many different cell activities and play an important role in programmed cell death. If mitochondrial function declines, then cells, and later on whole organs, deteriorate too. Other changes are known to occur in the expression patterns of genes, also known as epigenetic alterations, that affect the body's tissues and cells. Genes silenced or expressed only at low levels in newborns become prominent in older people, leading to the development of degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, which accelerate aging. Even if we could avoid all these harmful genetic alterations, not even our own cells could save us. The fact remains that cellular regeneration, the very stuff of life, declines as we age. The DNA in our cells is packaged within chromosomes, each of which has two protective regions at the extremities called telomeres. Those shorten every time cells replicate. When telomeres become too short, Cells stop replicating and die, slowing the body's ability to renew itself. With age, cells increasingly grow senescent too, a process that halts the cell cycle in times of risk, like when cancer cells are proliferating. But the response also kicks in more as we age, halting cell growth and cutting short their ability to replicate. Aging also involves stem cells that reside in many tissues and have the property of dividing without limits to replenish other cells. As we get older, stem cells decrease in number and tend to lose their regenerative potential, affecting tissue renewal and maintenance of our organs' original functions. Other changes revolve around cells' ability to function properly. As they age, they stop being able to do quality control on proteins, causing the accumulation of damaged and potentially toxic nutrients leading to excessive metabolic activity that could be fatal for them. Intercellular communication also slows, ultimately undermining the body's functional ability. There's a lot we don't yet understand about aging. Ultimately, does longer life as we know it come down to diet, exercise, medicine, or something else? Will future technologies like cell-repairing nanobots or gene therapy artificially extend our years? And do we want to live longer than we already do? Starting with 122 years as inspiration, there's no telling where our curiosity might take us. And I'm going to expand a little bit on this video. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So according to the World Health Organization, 
Aging results from the impact of the accumulation of a wide variety of damage to our cells over time. This leads to a gradual decrease in physical and mental capacity, a growing risk of disease, and ultimately death. But these, these changes are neither linear nor consistent, and they only loosely associate with a person's age and years. So while some 70-year-olds enjoy extremely good health and functioning, other 70-year-olds are frail and require significant help from others. And according to the National Institute on Aging, aging is associated with changes in dynamic biological, physiological, environmental, psychological, behavioral, and social processes. Some age-related changes are benign, such as graying hair, and others result in declines in function of the senses and activities of daily life and increased susceptibility to and frequency of diseases, frailty or disability. So I have listed here different types of age. So we have chronological age, biological age, and psychological age. Chronological age is the amount of time that has passed from your birth to the given date. It's your age in terms of years, months, days. This is the main way that people define their age. So uh, having a birthday, birthday celebration, saying that you are 80 years old. Biological age describes how many lifestyle factors like diet, exercise, and sleeping habits impact our age. So external factors like smoking, drinking, stress, and other factors can impact how you age biologically. So you could be considered older or younger biologically based on your lifestyle factors than you are chronologically. In fact, many gerontologists believe chronological age to be an incomplete figure because it doesn't take into account uh, these external factors. So, Biological age is determined by structures at the end of our chromosome, it's called telomeres. They keep our chromosomes from deteriorating and from fusing with nearby uh, chromosomes. This can impact how quickly ages, how quickly cells age and die. Scientists have discovered that the higher a person's chronological age, the shorter their telomeres. One study found that people with shorter telomeres were more likely to have early death or develop a disease or neurodegenerative disorder. However, a healthy lifestyle can reduce and lower these risks. Psychological age is also known as subjective age or age identity. This describes how old you feel, act, and behave. Also, there is a quote that goes, it's not how old you are, but how you are old. And you can go to the next slide. So this next video talks a little bit about the misconceptions of old age and how being older is different for everyone. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? If you can stand right there, that's your mark. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Great. Awesome. Just tell us your first name and your age. My real age? <laughs> My name is Paolo. I'm 25 years old. My name is Daniela, and I'm 19. 24. 35. 31. 33. I'm 26 years old. What age do you consider to be old? Late 40s. Maybe 50. <sighs> um. I feel like 30s and new 20s, so I'd say like 40 is old. I'd probably say 50s. I'd like you to show me how an old person would cross the street. Show me how an old person would send a text message. How might an old person do a push-up? Okay, hang on. 
one, there's someone I want you to meet. Hello, I'm Birch, I'm 66. Hi, I'm Daphne, and I'm 68. I'm Dee, and I'm 55. George Fassbinder, 75. <laughs> My name is Parvati, I'm 70. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We're gonna give you about two minutes to teach each other something that you are good at. I can teach you a jump that I do. Okay, please. Both of your legs mm -hmm. go up, mm -hmm. and your arm goes up, and your left arm goes like to the uh, side. Ready? Okay. One, two, three. Lift one, two, three. And bring it to your heart. And bring it to your heart. Add the head in. Yeah. You want to try to get your balance. And raise up. Now, bring your legs and your feet up. It's <laughs> <laughs> hard, right? Yeah. One, two, three, five, six, seven. So when you come out of the turn, either way, you go back to that place. Over. Now forward. Over. Yeah. <laughs> Squirt like this. And give me a hook. Hook. Jab, cross. Hook. And then we'll go like this, all right? One, two, three. <laughs> now, what age might you consider to be old? Probably 80 or 90. <laughs> he could just do everything that I told him to do. <laughs> An age that I would consider to be old now might be 100. <laughs> do you remember what you said? Yeah, yeah, I said uh, in the 50s, I thought that I would be old. But when I thought about it, like... <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm I, sorry. I can do it. <laughs> it really changed my thinking of what old is. <laughs> You've taught me something today. Clearly, there's no way she's old, you know? Now I know from today, hey, I don't look at age. <laughs> at my age, I feel like I did when I was in my 20s. There's so many things that I still want to do. There's so many things that I can do. As long as I'm growing and learning, then age doesn't matter. When people start stopping, that's when they start getting old. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks, Thank Daphne. you. It was great meeting you. <laughs> How long have you been doing this? Is this a new uh, skill? 40 years. Oh, wow. <laughs>
So now I'd like to talk about Alzheimer's disease, which is the disease that we focus on here at the Penn Memory Center, but also the disease that accounts for the most cases of dementia. So this is an irreversible progressive brain disease that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills. Uh, some risk factors include age, family history, and genetics. And currently there is no treatment available that stops the disease. And you can go to the next slide. So an important takeaway that I want to know is that Alzheimer's is a disease and dementia is a symptom. Uh, there are many conditions that can cause dementia as well. And a person can experience dementia without having Alzheimer's disease. Uh, sometimes people use those two interchangeably. So I'd like to make a point to point that out. And you can go to the next slide. So with all these definitions and terms, it might be hard to figure out like what changes are related to typical aging, things that you would normally see as you age versus signs of dementia. And so uh, some typical age related changes include missing a monthly payment, forgetting which day it is and remembering later, sometimes forgetting which word to use, losing things from time to time. Some signs of dementia can include an inability to manage a budget, losing track of the date or the season, difficulty having a conversation, misplacing things and being unable to retrace steps to find them later. Let me go to the next slide. And so a way we like to tell people if they are having memory problems or any problems in their cognition and they wanna know if it's serious enough for them to see their clinician, is that if you're having difficulty managing your money, taking your medications, using technology or using transportation, then it might be time to uh, see your primary care provider. Often a loved one or person who is closest to you will be able to see these changes better than you can and can advocate for you when you visit your primary care provider and you can go to the next slide. And so aside from aging, there are many other factors that can impact our health. Um, some of these other factors are considered social and structural determinants of health. People have different experiences, opportunities, and challenges based on background and situation. These social and structural factors can be important determinants of a person's health and well-being. Social determinants are the conditions and the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. So for example, your neighborhood environment can impact how much or how little pollution you are exposed to, uh, your access to certain services, or your safety. Your school can impact your quality of education, which is a lasting effect that can impact you later in life. And your family environment can impact how much support you had growing up and how much support you have currently. Structural determinants of health are the governing process, economic and social policies that affect pay, working conditions, housing, and education. So for example, things like segregation, unsafe working conditions, no access to housing, gentrification, or other policies can affect your quality of life. So these are events that compound over the life course. And the life course includes events and exposures across our lifetime from birth to older age. So all of these things that you experience from the time you're born until you're older. And these lived experiences and biology can both have cumulative effects over the life course, which can impact your health. And you can go to the next slide. So some factors that are considered social and structural determinants of health can include demographic data. So factors like race, age, sex, and gender that can impact your experiences in the world. Education and educational experiences, which can impact your financial status and your health literacy. Health literacy, which is the degree to which individuals have the ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves or others. Financial literacy, which is how much knowledge one has about their finances. 
occupation, which can impact your financial standing, socioeconomic status, which is the social standing or class of an individual or group. So this is often the combination of your educational experiences, your income and your occupation. Your social positioning, life stressors, including childhood stressors, subjective stress and lifetime stress. Your neighborhood, which can impact your access to healthy foods, safe and open space to exercise and access to certain hospitals. Religion, which can impact your experiences in the world. Your support systems, which can benefit one person or hold another person back who is without the support. Also, these factors can play a role in our risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. So for example, fewer years of education correlate with higher risk and incidence of Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Manual labor jobs may increase the likelihood of dementia diagnosis, where other types of jobs may actually provide protective factors against developing poor dementia outcomes. Lower socioeconomic status can contribute to higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, and experiencing more stress in life can increase your likelihood of developing worse memory. So now I'd like to share a brief story of one of our participants in our Typical Day photo project. Typical Day is a photography project that allows older adults living with mild cognitive impairment to document their lives as they address their condition. I'm going to read the story of a participant named Doris. Doris is no stranger to loss. The loss of her first son in infancy, her second son to incarceration, her grandmother and many aunts and uncles to Alzheimer's disease, and now her own memory. But having received her MCI diagnosis, she said, I was more relieved than scared because I, suspect, I suspected it. Matter of fact, I think it helps a lot because I'm aware of it now. I monitor myself. Doris surrounds herself with a caring network of friends who support each other through companionship and shared spirituality. A member of the Gospel Temple Baptist Church since the 1970s, she has forged close friendships with other members of the congregation who support each other and with both the mundane errands of everyday living and through significant personal losses, such as the death of a loved one. They check in on each other daily, go grocery shopping and pray together. Dolores says of a close friend, she's been a big help to me in my life and adjusting to whatever comes along. No matter what goes on, I can call her anytime, day or night. In a for for funeral home, Doris enjoys the challenge of a good crossword puzzle in conversation with her neighbor's inquisitive seven-year-old son. He's good therapy for me. He drives me crazy asking all these questions, but I answer them because he doesn't know and it's helping me and my memory. Although the diagnosis of MCI has been helpful to Doris, she is aware of how such a label affects how she is perceived by others. I don't think that the whole world needs to know. If the time comes that they need to know, then I share it, but right now it is something that I have to deal with first. So in Doris's story, you can hear a little bit about her support systems and how they help her through different life challenges and how she surrounds herself with her community to support her as she ages. You can also hear a bit about the stigma that comes with older age, in her case, having an MCI diagnosis and how that affects how many others may perceive her and how she navigates the world. So in her story, you can hear how these different social and structural determinants of health are playing out. And you can go to the next slide now. So before I play this video, I'd like to read some statistics on why brain health education matters. More than 5 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease. 15 million Americans are providing care for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. One in three older adults die with dementia caused by Alzheimer's or another disease. African Americans are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease but are largely underrepresented in research. So at first glance, these may come off as just another list of statistics, um, but when I think about the lives of the millions of Americans, the caregivers, and the cost of living with dementia and what that might mean for us all, it is something that motivates me to spread awareness about uh, the disease and think of ways that we can work towards helping those who are facing this reality. 
So one of the things we can provide is uh, tips on healthy brain aging and education on how to maintain our brain health as we age. And that's what this video is gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, so you can press play now. There is no way to avoid aging. But science has found some points that increase the probability of aging in a healthy way. Do not smoke. Tobacco not only damages the lungs, but also the cells in our entire body. On average, smokers die nine years earlier than non-smokers. Drink little or no alcohol. The consumption of alcohol damages our body and our cells. Eat less. A reduced intake of calories can extend life significantly. It is important to keep a healthy balance because malnutrition can cause damage too. Exercise regularly. The old saying, if you rest, you rust, is true. Regular exercise helps your body stay healthy. Enjoy the sun, but with sunscreen. Sunlight boosts the production of vitamin D and happiness hormones but UV radiation also damages the DNA. That's why you should only sunbathe with UV protection and not for too long. Learn to deal with stress in a competent way. Don't let others drive you crazy. Build a stable relationship. People in a long and stable relationship live longer. Educate yourself. Learning helps. A person who learns long and in a good way can age healthier. Don't forget medical checkups. Better be safe than sorry. Skin cancer, for example, can be treated very well if it is discovered early. Take advantage of checkup appointments with your physician. Enjoy life. Despite everything, do not forget to enjoy life. Aging in a healthy way is a mixture of genetic factors, social environment, and lifestyle. So I'd like to expand on that video a little bit. Um, so there's an expression that we'd like to share. If it's good for your heart, then it's good for your brain. Studies have shown that long-term high blood pressure, heart disease, and diabetes can increase the risk of developing dementia. So these are modifiable risk factors, meaning that there are small steps that we can take to lower these risks. Researchers have recommended the Mediterranean diet for both uh, healthy brain aging, and the Mediterranean diet is a generic term on the typical eating habits in the countries that border the Mediterranean Sea. So these include products like dairy products, fish and poultry, fruits, vegetables, bread and other cereals, potatoes, beans, nuts and seeds, and the use of olive oil. Exercise can also keep us healthy as we age. So this includes cardiovascular exercises like walking, running, and dancing. There are also several resources for older adults who want a fun, simple way to stay active. Um, so also the Penn Memory Center uh, tries to provide a lot of these uh, resources such as Dance for Health, uh, which was a series of weekly dance classes and social activities that promote brain health and healthy living in West Philadelphia. Uh, the program in the past has been uh, free and open to the public and in person. Uh, but right now, we've been working on ways to do it virtually. In fact, we actually had a virtual session just a few months back where we had uh, the dancers streaming themselves dancing while people were able to do the line dancing and follow along at home. And these dances are tailored to old, older adults. Also, the Pen Memory Center and the Time Out team recently collaborated to have an eight-week virtual exercise program called Shake It Up. Uh, the program focused on coordination, muscle activation, and meditation. Uh, the program was open to all members of the Penn Memory Center community, including all levels of mobility and their care partners. Uh, and right now we are in the process of working to provide future virtual dance programming and hopefully in person again one day. And you can go to the next slide. So while we know that some lifestyle choices may help with healthy brain aging. Research is one of the main ways that we can better understand how our brain changes over time and learn more about the aging brain. Some Alzheimer's disease studies can be either observational, meaning researchers 
watch how our brain changes over time, or they can be treatment studies, meaning that you receive an investigational drug. So you may be wondering why is this important or why would anyone want to participate in research? It's important for several reasons. Your participation directly advances research. You are helping future generations fight against Alzheimer's disease. You are provided with a comprehensive memory assessment that can help you understand how your brain health may be changing over time. We also work to connect you with additional resources, uh, such as writing letters to your doctor or the continuation of your care or recommending appropriate support groups. Being a research participant means giving back to your community and contributing to scientific advancements. And this leads to a world where we better understand aging and the aging brain. So if you were interested in studies, uh, to participate here at the Penn Memory Center, we look to aging and older. So you would need a reliable study partner who can provide information about your functioning and you have to be willing to have an MRI or PET scan. And I did wanna talk a little bit about what these different components mean in case you might be wondering. So what is an MRI? An MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So it's a machine that creates pictures of the body. It does this using magnetic fields. So for some of our studies, you go into the MRI for approximately an hour. The machine makes some noise, so you'll be given headphones and you can request the headphones to play music. Your study coordinator will check in every so often to see how you're doing and may ask you to remain awake for certain portions. And there's also a call button that you can squeeze if you need to alert your coordinator about anything that might want you to exit the machine early. So what is a PET scan? A PET scan starts, stands for positron emission tomography. This is a type of imaging test that reveals how your organs, tissues are functioning. A tracer is injected into your arm and you wait for about an hour and then the PET scan is conducted. The tracer binds to specific substances in the brain, such as amyloid and tau, that allow us to measure them. And we use these PET scans to measure these two proteins that are associated with developing Alzheimer's disease dementia. And who's a reliable study partner? So a reliable study partner is someone who can answer questions about your functioning, how you carry out the activities in your daily life, how your memory, thinking, and actions may be changing over time. Um, this is a person who will consistently come with you to all of your visits and support you throughout the study. And this is that person who would know a little bit more about your changes in cognition than you would. So if that's something that you would be interested in, you can reach out to myself or you could go to registry and our largest studies, the aging brain cohort study. And you can go to the next slide. this video inspiring us all that it's never too late to learn. I started dancing on the pole when I was 59 years old. I was stuck at a desk job where I was doing a lot of work behind the computer. Although I was physical, I realized I was not really giving myself the kind of program I needed. I wasn't doing anything for my cardiovascular and there were other muscle groups I needed to build. That's when I realized that I need to get out there and do something because I wanted to have longevity. I think the first time that I pole danced, the teacher thought I wouldn't be back because I couldn't get up the pole. I think what happens is you get little victories. All of a sudden you go, oh, I got this move, or oh, now I'm able to climb up halfway. These little goals that I set, because if I looked at the big goal and saw how fabulous some of these people are, I probably would have thought, oh, I'm too old or I don't have it. But I made the competition with myself. My competition's in the mirror. I realized in life that it's really important to go after your dreams. And sometimes they don't manifest the way you want to, but I would rather have these little tiny challenges that didn't work that have a life of what if. As I've gotten older, I've learned that you can really stretch your limits with your body. A lot of things I thought I would never be able to do, 
I just kept working at them. I want people to know they shouldn't let age or any limitation keep them from going passionately after their dreams. In life, you have to let your reach exceed your grasp. I'm Brenna Pontarelli. I'm 66 years old.